warm welcome and good evening to all of you and a special warm welcome to Vinita Damodaran whose lecture you all have just heard. For those of you who have just joined us, this is part of an exhibition called Phytopia of the Science Gallery Bengaluru. Science Gallery Bengaluru is a part of an international gallery international network of galleries across the world. We are eight of us and we are university linked. In Bangalore, we are established with the strong support of the government of Karnataka. And in, as partners, we have the Indian Institute of Science, the National Center for Biological Sciences and Shristi. This particular program has been organized in collaboration with the Bangalore International Center, who we are absolutely delighted to always collaborate with. I'd like to take a moment to also request you all to please complete the feedback form after you've been through the experience this evening, because it helps us keep improving our offerings, but also to learn more about what you thought about the program. Most critically for this evening, as we proceed, please also post your questions in the Q&A box provided. I'm delighted to introduce the historian Vinita Damodaran to you all. As I was just discussing with her before the program started, the first time I met Vinita was in 1996 when I was a young student in London. And I still remember the warmth with which she received me in Sussex in her office, a warmth that she has shared with students and colleagues um, for a long time now. Currently, she is a professor at Sussex, at the University of Sussex, and she is the director of the Center for World Environmental History. Her work ranges from the social and political history of Bihar to the environment history, environmental history of South Asia, including using historical records to understand climate change in the Indian Ocean world. Her publications are many. But a few that I would like to mention here are Broken Promises, Indian Nationalism and the Congress Party in Bihar, Nature and the Orient, Essays on the Environmental History of South and Southeast Asia, Postcolonial India, History, Politics and Culture, and more recently, East India Company and the Natural World. Our exhibition Phytopia, which I mentioned at the start, features an essay of Vinita's about Janaki Ammal, the plant geneticist, alongside some photographs which she has generously contributed to us. These are up on our exhibition website and those of you who haven't had the chance to see it yet, I'd strongly encourage that you do so. This is the fifth day of our exhibition and we are on for another five. We also have other photographs about Janaki Ammal, courtesy of the John Innes Center, our partners on this exhibition. So those of you who had the opportunity to listen to Vinita talk about Janaki Ammal would have already understood what a fascinating and absolutely wonderfully interesting figure Janaki Ammal is. And I'd like to begin by just saying a couple of sentences and, and, and uh, sort of in, by way of a summary of the lecture that Vinita just gave, but also to lead into a few questions about um, the lecture and Vinita's research on Janaki Ammal. So, as I, as I mentioned, Jana Campbell was a plant geneticist uh, in the middle decades of the 20th century. She worked in India as well as in England, held strong views, um, and was, was one of the very, very small cast of characters, especially female characters, in the Indian scientific enterprise in the middle decades of the 20th century to rise high in ranks, to lead a laboratory, to lead the restructuring and reorganization of other laboratories across India, and what I'd like to do is probably start with a few questions that, that explore probably to a slightly more extent the questions and the ideas that Vinita raised already in her lecture. So let me start by asking you, um, Vinita, you know, us as, as sort of, you know, historians of science, historians of the environment, the larger historical community of South Asia, we recognize why a figure like Janaki is very, very important. May I ask you to share with our audiences, in your view, why should we, why should we care about or why should we know about Janaki Ammal today in India, but also elsewhere? Thank you, Janaki, for that very fulsome introduction. I first came across Janaki Ammal um, 
as I said in the lecture, when I looked at this uh, book um, on man and nature, which was one of the early books on how man changed um, nature, and it was a Chicago meeting of 1955, and I was producing the book. It had uh, it was a conference held in memory uh, uh, of Carl Sauer. It it had a, a huge number of very important. Um, agronomists, geographers um, uh, participating in it. And I, I was intrigued to find that there was an Indian woman um, represented uh, in, in the conference and she was speaking of the subsist of, uh, on subsistence agriculture in, uh, in India. And not only was she, the, uh, was she Indian, but she was the only woman participant in the conference. Mm. Um, and I got uh, researching uh, very quickly on her and discovered, uh, and that she was quite unknown to me at that time. And I then discovered that she had a formidable history, uh, some of which you've just outlined, uh, in being an institutional builder in post-colonial India, in reorganizing uh, uh, the Botanical Survey of India, in heading the uh, Central Laboratory in Lucknow and so on. But she had been largely forgotten in India. So I just then proceeded on a trail uh, to find her. And, and the more I dug, the more um, I didn't set out to do a biography. I was just intrigued by her. Uh, uh, the more I uh, 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 dug, the more uh, she came out as an original uh, first in many ways. She was the first woman PhD in, um, in botany in the US. She was the first female employee of the Royal Horticultural Society in Wisley Hall. Um, and all these uh, and uh, <clears throat> and all these remarkable firsts uh, had been completely ignored both by the scientific establishment in India and the scientific establishment in Britain, hmm. um, which we then set about trying to readdress in our small way by having a small exhibition on her. Uh, it, where she was remembered was at the Botanical Survey of India in Calcutta. Um, um, as one of their directors, and, uh, and they had a bust of her. Uh, but she had been largely um, set aside even there. So this was an amazingly important exercise just to uh, redress the lacunae in the history of science in India. And um, a book by Neelam Kumar uh, on women in science in India, which was a sort of a reader, didn't have her either, which was published about 10 years ago. So I was just intrigued by the fact of her absence and wanted to redress that. Um, so, you know, outside of the historic, sort of, you know, the, the out of, outside of the scientific community or outside of the historian or historians of science community, what would you say to others as to why they should, you know, why, why they should consider a woman of her significance? And, you know, what, what would it have, in a way, taken someone like her to rise to where she did. So she comes from uh, a Kerala, as we know. She is um, comes from a, a, a relatively low caste background, uh, the Tiyas of Kerala. Um, if you uh, know the history of that part of uh, Kerala, which she comes from Malabar, from Telichuri, uh, 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 which was the site of the first English factory uh, in 1600. So there were a lot of uh, uh, British um, uh, planters and traders uh, on that coast hmm. who uh, married local women or cohabited with local women. And so the, there was a whole uh, group of white tiyas um, in Telichuri. So she came from a white tia background, but her um, origins are slightly more uh, interesting. Her, uh, her, uh, step, uh, her grandfather was John Child Hannington of the uh, British civil service who had been a commissioner uh, in uh, in Madras, uh, a, quite a leading civil servant. And her mother was the illegitimate uh, 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 daughter of Kurumbi, who was uh, one of the local women in uh, Telichuri, who uh, 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 And they had a, quite a long-term relationship. It was not a short-term relationship. It was a 20-year relationship that John Child Hannington shared with Kurumbi. And the, the result was Johnny Kemal's mother, who married into quite a uh, illustrious local family of Thiers. And Johnny Kemal was um, uh, one of 11 children um, of, this, of this union between her mother, who was then um, 14 or 15, and her father, who was 34, uh, and who became um, under uh, John Child Hannington's patronage, 
a sub judge of the Territory Court. Uh, so there was a very, very interesting uh, background. She was very well educated. But after her father's death, uh, um, the, the family uh, was growing up in sort of genteel poverty. Um, and they are, but it's quite a westernized uh, family. The diaries of her brother talk about learning geography in school, snipe shooting, uh, and so on. So it was the, the girls um, and the boys had quite a westernized education, but she made most of that education by deciding not to choose marriage, but to choose um, a life of uh, edu uh, 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 education above uh, marriage. And when she went to Madras to further her education and her studies, she was picked up um, as a barber scholar and went to Michigan. And then there was no turning back because she joined as a barber scholar in 1924. She then became a barber fellow in 1928 and she got a DSE in 1931. So the trajectory is quite remarkable uh, and shows a highly spirited, highly individual uh, trajectory which, uh, which I have highlighted as bordering on the cusp of caste and race. And this marginal, um, the marginal uh, 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 life that she, you know, that the borders, that because she inhabited these boundaries between caste and race, she was able to develop a quite a creative um, career uh, mm -hmm. and identity for herself. It's absolutely fascinating. I mean, it's, it's as much a social history of India as it is a social, a cultural history of gender and, and um, also access to higher education, the choice of a scientific career. I mean, many, many strands that actually, you know, uh, come together because, you know, like, like when I said it, um, uh, at, at the start that, you know, she's one of the very, very few people uh, or cast of characters, especially female uh, characters in the Indian scientific community at that time. I mean, the only other person I can think of is Anna Mani, uh, you know, who came close to accomplishing the kind of things that Janaki Amal did. Um, I'm not going to ask you the question of has anything changed since, because I think many of us in many ways know the answer to that, but we might come to that uh, later. I'd love to know your reading uh, of her relationship Two, two men who come, that, that comes through very strongly in your lecture, but also, you know, things that we've known um, in the archives that have been preserved, of course, not, not much, unfortunately, uh, has been preserved. Uh, her own letters, if I'm not mistaken, have been, um, have been destroyed, but it's only sure, letters yeah. that she wrote to others that survive in their personal papers, and yeah, archives, yeah, especially yeah. Darlington and, and Haldane. So I'd, I'd love to know your reading of her relationship um, with Haldane as well as Darlington, uh, and also a comparison between the two, because these are two, you know, very, very highly regarded figures in the middle decades of the 20th century, with Haldane's, of course, sort of very colorful history also and his association with India and the, and the work that he did after coming here. Uh, but also one more person who I would like to throw into the mix, although he absolutely doesn't belong in that mix, um, is, the, is, is the first prime minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru who I imagine had at least some correspondence with her, uh, given, you know, given the kind of positions she came to occupy, it's hard to imagine that she wasn't in a way known in those circles or, you know, um, in a way moving around in those circles. So could you tell us a little bit more about her relationship individually to Holiday and Darlington and, and the first prime minister, but also uh, especially the differences be, um, in her relationship between say Holiday and Darlington and how they, how they panned out or how they figured out in, the, in how her career unfolded. Yeah. So both Holden and Darlington were leading um, scientists of the time, uh, mathematical statisticians, uh, biologists, cytologists of eminence. And she uh, established independent relationships with both of them. Uh, so Darlington, um, quite earlier on, because her supervisor with whom she worked um, in uh, Michigan had sent her on a quest of Darlington when she arrived in 1931 in London. Uh, she sent him a letter, her first letter. Uh, is a very exploratory sort of letter, um, which I can um, read out, which is extremely, um, you know, it's, it, it, uh, let me just um, quickly find it. Um, um, 
So here she is. Dear Mr. Darlington, this is the first letter, May 29, 1931. Uh, Dr. Davis of the University of Michigan wrote to you, I believe, to tell you that I should be in England this summer and that I'm anxious to do the cytology of a triploid eggplant mm. at the John Innes Horticultural Institute. I shall be in London from Monday next and I should like to see you as soon as possible after my arrival. My address will be 62 Lebanon Park, Twickenham. And I would be grateful if you would let me know when it would be convenient for you to see me. Oh, nice. So she, here she is, a very exploratory letter. And she ends up working with him for the next few months. Um, and uh, Darlington, meanwhile, is, is, is sort of leading this very, um, you know, he is seen to be this very colorful character in the, <laughs> in the Institute. He has his own laboratory. Uh, and he immediately takes her under this wing. And what is very interesting is that um, when he takes her under his wing, Darlington is not unknown uh, to have had relationships with several of his female, uh, female researchers. And unfortunately, it looks like, or fortunately, it looks like that Amal uh, was one of them that he briefly had a relationship with. The mentoring of men of science at that time uh, related to, no, you know, having some sort of informal and intimate relationships with their female researchers. And unfortunately uh, for Johnny K. Amal, she did come under his, um, his wing, mm -hmm. as it were, very, very briefly. Mm -hmm. But uh, she was able to uh, detach herself very quickly and establish an independent career for herself. But it's quite surprising that she does not figure very prominently in a biography of C.D. Darlington mm -hmm. uh, himself. And that was a lacune on the part of C.D. Darlington's biographer, Harmon. Yes. Um, which I think uh, he should note because she was much more than just one of his researchers. She was quite a prominent researcher and she double and she went on to collaborate quite extensively with her on the chromosome atlas of cultivated yes. plants. Yes. Um, but he did have an uh, influence on her in terms of because Darlington was at the um, at the right of the eugenics movement. Uh, uh, because uh, as we know, um, uh, it, uh, the history of genetics which uh, uh, he's a man who seemed to have invented the chromosome. The history of genetics at this time was rapidly moving towards the direction of eugenics. The links between eugenics and genetics in the 1930s are quite well known and have been yes. researched. And Darlington was um, uh, using uh, Amal as a collaborator in his early genetic forays. And he was very interested in the castes and tribes and races of India. Hmm. And uh, Johnny Kemal uh, became a member, very, very interesting, in 1931 of the Eugenic Society in Britain. Uh, oh, wow. Which is, uh, which is quite okay. interesting. Well, well, her relationship with Holden uh, is, more in, uh, is more unusual and interesting. They were, Holden, of course, as we know, came back to India and he uh, was at the left of the eugenics movement. He, had, of course, was highly critical of eugenics. Um, and he, his relationship with John K. Mal was primarily on the basis of getting contributions to mm -hmm. the journal Heredity that he had set up. Um, and uh, they both uh, uh, disliked Ruggles Gates, who was the husband, um, the ex-husband of Maurice Stopes, who was someone who uh, uh, was uh, considerably uh, not... Um, uh, on a level playing field with Amal either tried to detract her detract from her work. So there were these all these local politics that she was engaged in. But hmm. she managed to rise above them and establish quite independent scientific relationships with both these men, uh, apart from having a, had a brief affair with Darlington in the 1930s. Yeah, and, and the first prime minister, whatever little you might Yeah, know. and with Nehru, the relationship was quite interesting. She clearly was on a plane with him in 48. Whether mm -hmm. she spoke to him, she just remembers the fact that um, he uh, he was met off the plane. There were crowds. Uh, but later on, she did. Uh, she attended several meetings with him. She Her letters, you know, she's never a name dropper. So she says, yes, spoke to Nehru. So it's quite clear that uh, Nehru was quite instrumental in her uh, setting up, um, uh, you know, her, her, her uh, later on her importance as a national scientist. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes across in her letters, but in a very humble, in a completely, um, you know, offhand sort of way. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, uh, and that is quite remarkable about her because um, she never let on how important she was even to her own family. Mm -hmm. uh, because she was writing letters from all over the world. She was in Russia. She was, she had uh, Hungarian scientists, Australian scientists she was working with. 
She was traveling around the world. Um, Darlington would write in his diary, had Chelsea and crumpets with Jonicky. I had uh, the had uh, crumpets and curry and crumpets with Jonicky in Chelsea. Sorry. Right. I had curry and crumpets with Jonicky in Chelsea. Uh, but it was always, it was just, yeah, she, you know, it's a remarkable life for someone. Yes. Um, and all these equivocal un- encounters, or, uh, which possibly the cusp of empire also I loved, um, which we see as the cosmopolitan world of science today. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's, that's what's fascinating about her because, you know, uh, I mean, she was a female scientist heading the Central Botanical Laboratory. She was responsible for, as you already shared with us, restructuring the Botanical Survey of India. She was responsible for setting up regional centers across India for the Botanical Survey of India. You know, so this is someone who is, you know, in many ways, the peer and colleague of people like Prasanta Chandra Mahalanobis, Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar, Homi Jangir Baba, D.S. Kothari, Dalat Singh Kothari, others who are setting up similar labs across India and heading them and establishing centers across India, establishing research fields, experimental facilities, you know, the kind of infrastructure that was laid in order to make the scientific enterprise, in a sense, you know, grow with this with the status sort of agenda or, or the reason of state, as, as some of us would call it, in the middle decades of the 20th century. And, and she is literally, I mean, apart from Anamani, the only other female scientist who's working at that level. I mean, it's, it's astonishing that we do not have, um, we do not have more biographies of her. We do not have more information about her. We do not, in a way, you know, hold her up as a role model. Also for um, the kind of discussions we have about gender and science today, you know, um, which is, um, which are, which are required, but you know, I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's to me, to me quite astonishing. So, but it's, uh, so com- coming back to the middle decades of the 20th century, and, and I, and I, and I love the way you alluded to, you know, that, that transition, because like all the other uh, people I mentioned right now, um, Janaki and Annamani are also characters of transition or, or, personalities of transition or figures of transition. It's, it's that moment that moves from empire towards independence. Um, and, you know, their careers in a way change, right? Like at, at one moment, if you see, even, even for someone as, as sort of, you know, uh, uh, celebrated as C.V. Raman, at one moment, they are scientists of, the, of citizens of the British empire. At another moment, they are Indian scientists. And, and in a way, how the world perceives them, but also how they perceive their own role in the establishment of this new India also changes within the span of less than a decade, right? Like it's the mid forties to early fifties. You just see their own perspective has, has changed. And so how do you, how in, in your reading, I mean, the close reading that you've made of her character, her work, her letters, everything, how do you see this transition playing out? What did she think of empire? What did she think of independence? What did she think of, you know, the new state and its agenda coming up? It's very interesting. She had very close relationships, as I said, with the British scientific establishment, and mm-hmm. um, and uh, albeit uh, the patriarchal scientific establishment of Darlington and others, which had been established. But at the same time, when she was, uh, she also faced, as I said, uh, as early as the 30s, when she worked in the Sugarcane Breeding Institute in India, hmm. the male Brahminical scientific establishment uh, of that institute, with Venkatraman as being its head, and she was aware of both of these. And um, she uh, she was uh, very critical of Venkat Raman and was very, very happy to visit C.V. Raman's uh, lab, which we know also was not a happy place for women from Abbasur's work. So, uh, the, but she uh, was uh, very highly uh, sort of uh, complimentary about, about Raman and his, uh, uh, his, his scientific um, work in, in the context of the how his lab function. So she was aware that there were these, um, uh, both, both in uh, India and in Britain, there were these pressures working on her. Hmm. But when she embraces, um, uh, and she's also tempted, for example, because the facilities offered to go back to England, also because of the relationship with Darlington and the scientific work she engaged in in the 40s. And she's tempted to go back to her attic flat in, uh, in Wisley. Uh, but she, when Nehru sort of uh, interferes and, and invites her to work in India, and this is uh, 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 when she decides to stay on in India, she then makes a remarkable change. She makes a remarkable change in embracing a sort of uh, understanding of science, which she feels needs to be 
um, much more located within Indian universities. And here she is with uh, Meghnath Saha, and she's not with um, S.S. Bhatnagar, who believes, who believes in the <laughs> setting up of these independent nationalist laboratories. Yeah. She, I think, is very sad when science, um, uh, uh, the, the, with a much more utilitarian understanding of science, which India mm -hmm. embraced, in the 50s and she would have uh, gone the way of Meghnath Saha and there's this debate which I think has been alluded to by others much more quickly we've looked at the debate in the 50s about where science should be located in the universities or in, the, in, the, or in these national laboratories and I think she's at the losing end of that battle and she's very critical of also her PhD students that she then inherits because uh, she doesn't find them worthy enough um, um, but she had still has quite a remarkable coterie of uh, students and collaborators in India. So mm -hmm. her work in India, I think, uh, uh, starts with a sense, uh, in some senses, on the wrong foot, where she's where she's on the side of Meghnath Saha, not on the side of setting up all these laboratories. But then when she does, but she does this remarkably well. But then when um, what happens, um, she's um, kind of uh, taken in by the fact. Uh, or she's very upset by the fact that the developmental agendas of the new Indian state are deforesting quite widely. Yeah. Um, and uh, she goes in trace of the Magnolia uh, tree, graffiti tree and finds only one left in Assam. So she has uh, got her finger on the pulse of what is happening in terms of development, deforestation and so on in the 1950s in India. And she's quite attuned and au uh, fait with that. She's also moving away from the Q paradigm. So she understands that Q has had a hold in India. One of the first uh, directors appointed are, are, is this Jesuit, Shantapu, who is a Q appointee. But when she decides to move, when she is then, then asked to, um, she's then an officer on special duty. But then when mm -hmm. she's given the direction to reorganize the Banalik Survey, she's very clear that she wants to move away from Q. Mm -hmm. And that is, a, again, quite an independent uh, analysis. Uh, of what Indian botany needs. Uh, and I think that is, again, testimony to her originality and her institutional building work, which is directing her away from the Q mm. paradigms uh, mm. of understanding, uh, uh, of conceptualizing Indian botany. And more of its floristic attachments to Malaysia, East Asia, and so on, which is something that she's very, very interested in, in her research work. Mm. Could you tell us a little bit about what is it about the Q paradigm? So this is, of course, for those of you who probably haven't caught it yet, the Royal Kew Gardens, uh, Botanical yeah. Gardens in so London. So Kew had this, um, since uh, the 19th century, and uh, uh, and, and uh, Hooker, who was one of the directors of Kew, um, who had uh, established the flora of British India in 12 volumes in the mm -hmm. 1870s, there was no new flora of India. In fact, there's still no new flora of British India. And the Botanical Survey of India is still producing this new flora. Um, uh, I think they're meant to be about 30 volumes of their, they've done half of them so far. Okay. So the, the flora of uh, British India was a paradigmatic exercise on the basis of um, a, a uh, systematic botany that it established. And Jani K. Mal, when she takes over the reorganization of the Botanical Survey of India, she is moving away from that paradigm by uh, uh, much by understanding much more local variation and local affiliation and understanding of plants. So I think in some senses where you have the debate uh, among the lumpers and the splitters in terms of how you classify plants, there, mm -hmm. there was a sense in which she was more engaged in a floristic exercise which linked up uh, plants much more to their, um, to, to, uh, to uh, East Asia, to Burma, mm -hmm. uh, to Malaysia and so on. So uh, she had a, uh, you know, she, Again, she was a field botanist. She was, she's very often running away to the irulas of Kerala or, 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 or cultivating yams. Whenever she's distressed, for example, when uh, Shantapu was established, when Shantapu was appointed as the, the first director by Q, she says, I'm devastated. I've run away to my irulas uh, and I'm digging yams, you know. Uh, so it's, it's that field botany uh, and ethnobotany that she is very highly regarded for, and I think much of the her, the interest in medicinal plants and ethnobotany also um, uh, we need to understand her as one of the India's leading and original ethnobotanists. Yeah. Okay. So I'd just like to remind our audiences that they shouldn't allow me to monopolize the conversation before I post their questions in the Q and A box. So uh, my my I, I have 
I have a bunch of other questions to ask, but I'll, I'll start taking questions also from our audience. Yes. Um, so Poonam would like to know uh, if you might share your views on how a feminist perspective can differently contribute to our expanding understanding of science. Again, um, a very interesting question. Uh, one thing about Amal, Amal did not see herself as a feminist. Uh, hmm. Hers was a life, um, a scientific life. She saw herself as a person of science, not as a man or a woman. And she never would have seen also, and, I, and that that is remarkable. She never would have seen herself as being hard done by either on the basis of gender or race. And that is testimony to her supreme confidence uh, as a scientist. Um, and it's only as, a, as a, a biographer that you can see how hard done by she was at mm -hmm. every step of her career. Um, and how both, I mean, when we view her through the prism of both gender and race, uh, we can see the unconscious and conscious biases uh, mm -hmm. that imposed a glass ceiling on her life, you know. Um, and I think for, uh, in terms of your question, uh, it is this glass ceiling um, that women in India then and now uh, have faced, are facing, um, Dalit women in particular will be facing in terms of uh, the, the opportunities for science, um, the opportunities, and also the way in which, for example, pure science in India uh, is, as Janaki Amal pointed out, not encouraged in the university. So, do, to, you know, so somehow to regenerate science in the university is to allow for a sort of creative um, scientific future for our young emerging scientists would be the way forward, I think. Uh, to move away from a narrow utilitarian understanding of science, um, mm. uh, to have much more blue sky research, which would bring in um, and uh, you know uh, feminine traditions of science and other traditions of uh, uh, indigenous traditions of science, reinvoking science in the universities. I think in in ways unimaginable uh, unimaginable to us today um, would be the way forward. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have Shubhashree here asking. Uh, she thanks you, of course, for, for the wonderful talk. Um, she has two questions. Um, she would like to know more about the work that Janaki Ammal did with Haldane. And um, uh, another question, which probably you could take first because it's probably easier to answer. Why is she referred to as Ammal when it is not exactly a surname? Ah, oh, interesting. The, the, let me answer the second question first. Um, the second question is uh, intriguing to me because when she is, when she was a Babo fellow, she she's known as Edvalatta Kakata Janaki. That's that's her name, which is you know the which is um, uh, the in Kerala and the matrilineal tradition you take your name um, your initials from your mother's house name. So Edvalatta is the her mother uh, her uh, mother's house house name Kakkat, her father's house name. So E K. Uh, E.K. Janaki would, would, was her was what she was known as. Now she adds the suffix of Amal at some point, and that I think is uh, um, um, uh, bowing to uh, uh, either the fact, and this is, she's not ex uh, she's not uh, uh, explained in her letters. Apart from uh, telling John Darlington in one of her letters what E.K. stands for, she hasn't yeah. explained why she adds that suffix or when she adds that. But obviously, to add a second name, so you add a second name, Amal being a South Indian name, it could be uh, bowing to caste preference. I mean, this I do not know. I haven't established. I cannot say this for her. But certainly, it was a second name that she uh, added. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah. The other question about what she did with Holden, her, her work with Holden uh, was in the form of, she didn't, uh, work, collaborate with Holden. Uh, she submitted articles for his journal mm -hmm. and she uh, uh, was very active in um, showing him around parts of India. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so she uh, was instrumental in taking him to several different laboratories uh, and tours around India when he arrived and working with um, some of his junior colleagues. So she uh, her collaborative work was mainly, as I said, her work, uh, her primary work was on intergeneric hybrids and plants, uh, which she had worked with with Darlington. And some of these uh, 
these, these plants were flowering 20 years later uh, and she was getting them into the journals of science and heredity, sometimes with the help of Amal, uh, sometimes with the help of Darlington and sometimes with, uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, Holdane. You know, I mean, when I when I look at uh, when I understand now that Amal was was a name she took on in a sense um, later in life. I mean, you know, it, it also reminds me of what C. V. Raman did, right? Like, it, yeah. uh, it, it's a name he took on in order to become more legible in a sense to the larger scientific community. It's a name people can remember. It's a name people can actually take on as opposed to the longer um, you know name which they might not be able to either pronounce. I mean, we you know those, these problems continue even today. And at that yeah, point, yeah, I can only yeah. imagine it was much harder. Yeah. And Amal is, not, is more, more common in, in Tamil Nadu than it is in uh, Kerala. So it's interesting that she chose that South Indian suffix of Amal. Yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah. So I think that the, whether it would be interesting to see whether there was a caste preference there, whether she was disguising the caste, there could be an element there. But uh, yeah. there's nothing in her letters to indicate that. So I, as a biographer, I cannot say that. Yeah. Yes, yes. So you are writing a biography. I mean, as a nascent biographer of sorts. Wonderful. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, wonderful. Not, I'm not at the moment, no, um, seriously writing a biography, yeah. Okay. No, it would, it would be lovely to see a biography come, you know, yes. because I think that's, there are people that's, working uh, on it and I encourage them to do so, yeah. Yeah. It's, a, think, it's yeah. a neglected genre. I mean, it's yeah, a neglected, it's a, yeah. yeah uh, and, and one would love to see that happen. Um, you know, I mean, and this just brings me also to you know the the question of archives right archives for the history of contemporary science in india we just it it it, it is such an incredibly impoverished landscape you know we we do not uh, you know we, we do not have a symmetry of sources in a sense right because the personal papers often of scientists who live and work in india are not available as opposed to the personal papers for um, you know uh, scientists in europe or america especially uh, you you know what Haldane wrote to a colleague or a friend, including the you know the love and the insults and the tenderness and and everything, right? It, it's there, and you understand people. But often, I mean, in, in, in India, personal papers are almost extremely you know, well, no, they're almost not there, and they're extremely hard to come by. And people are reluctant to leave personal papers um, in institutional archives, for example, which is which is a tragedy because it means uh, you know writing biographies is that much harder. You can yes, only absolutely. write from institutional papers or professional archives of people available. And, and mm. uh, I mean, you can write, you can have biographies of someone like Mohandas Gandhi or Jawaharlal Nehru because they left behind personal papers, their letters with their warts and all personalities are available for us to see to write a biography. Um, in the case of science, it's, it's, it's really, really difficult. Um, I mean, it is shocking. I mean, with, with Janaki Amal in particular, uh, I really feel strongly, I, rec I, I second everything that you've said. And India really needs to think really clearly about how it accesses these. Because her, she, was, she died in 1984. She was mm. living in Madhura Vale. Mm. Uh, she was very well known by the scientific establishment um, yeah. low, you know, by then. Nobody made an effort yep. uh, to take either her library or her archives. And that, that, I mean, in the 80s, that's still quite shocking when we have an archival tradition. Yes. And uh, um, yeah, so and her entire slide collection was mm, smashed oh. to bits. So she had a private library in um, Erathil House in Telichuri, yeah. uh, which was sold a few years later. And her letters were found floating in the rain um, after it was sold. So it's not that we are not aware of her importance. It's that the institutes themselves, the Botanical Survey of India, could only find her published manuscripts for me, published work for me. Yep. Yeah. They could find That's... nothing archival for me. And oh. that is a tragedy which India really needs. And someone like you in a position now, will, I mean, who, who's, who's voicing this, I think will be able to do a lot more in this regard where we collect them now. Yeah. Yes, yes. So we are trying, we are trying, we're trying to set up a project called Recollect India, where we are starting out with oral history so that at least we, we in a way, catch the memories of those who are still around, the first generation of free India scientists, engineers, and lab technicians. And then through that, hopefully also get them to give personal papers, et cetera, um, and objects to established archives, which can preserve them through which we can, you know, populate the history of science in India. 
For example, MS Swaminathan. MS, she worked quite closely with MS Swaminathan in the Silent Valley project, you know. Yeah. So, so MS Swaminathan would be someone who should be on your list as well, who's still alive. and Most certainly. Most certainly. Thank you. We'll be in touch about that. I'll go, I'll move on to a question uh, from Dhanya Lakshmi. Um, she's, who's a clinical geneticist and she wants to know, uh, or she's curious to find out if Janaki Amal did support the eugenics movement at large. And if, if at all, did she have any explanation for it later? So once again, these, all I have is a letter. She didn't write on eugenics. If you want to um, read the eugenicist stuff that was coming out in the thirties, Darlington is his evolutionary ideas, which were really, really, uh, have been really criticized by everyone um, on races of man. But what it, uh, is where you go to see what uh, people like Darlington were thinking in the 40s uh, uh, until the UNESCO um, uh, uh, statement of 19, uh, in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. So, but what Darlington was doing, he was visiting India periodically Hmm. And Janaki would supply him material on castes and races and tribes of India. And that material would feed into his eugenic ideas. Oh so whether she was doing it wittingly or unwittingly or critically, it's not clear from the letters. But hmm. certainly she was sending him material. Hmm. Uh, her own views on it is, um, I'm sure... Um, again, this is, uh, you know, her scientific words were very much linked to cytology and botany and, and intergeneric hybrids. Uh, she didn't write on this uh, topic at all, but she was very interested in the, the medicinal and ethnobotanical knowledge of lower castes and, and tribes hmm. and, and indigenous knowledge. But it was not racialized in the way in which you, the eugenics movement was racializing the stuff. Um, it was very much, she was aware, she was interested in difference, she was interested in um the anthropology of difference uh, but she was not um a eugenicist in any form or shape is my mm. understanding okay uh, we have unikrishnan from telicheri who uh, says that as far as he's aware uh, and he comes from telicheri he's uh, ammal has been or ammar has been uh, usually associated with upper caste women it is a term associated with respectability that might have something to do with the choice yeah, so i yeah, think yeah, it yeah, aligns yeah. with what you were saying yes yes, yes. Um, what you were saying um now, uh, I have Aman asking, can you tell us more about Janaki's role as a public scientist in influencing the discourse on environmental conservation? So this stage of her life, she was already very critical of the deforestation of India in the 1950s and um, the developmental agendas of the Indian state. And I, if, we, if we look at what was happening po immediately post-independence, and this is a history of the Indian environment that needs to be written, and if there's anyone out there who wants to write it, they should do it. Um, because immediately after 47, um, there was uh, a huge amount of environmental destruction that happened. Uh, uh, the Americans were going around, uh, in fact, shooting uh, tigers. They were being... It, it, it was free for all before, um, as we know, the setting up of uh, regulations and then later on um, Jairam Ramesh has written quite in, uh, instructively about uh, Mrs. Gandhi and, and setting up of environmental regulations in India. But there was a period between the 50s and the 60s that it was free for all. And Johnny Gimal was um, uh, was uh, uh, aware of this and she was very highly critical of this and she was she was lending a voice to the environmental conservation movement. And most notably, um, the environmental conservation in the 70s with regard to the Silent Valley. So when the Silent Valley happened, she, along with other scientists, she was not the only one, uh, she becomes very interested in carrying out uh, a, a botanical survey of the plants and trees of the Silent Valley as a project for the government of India. Hmm. Um, she talks a lot about unfinished, pro uh, some of these projects which were finished or unfinished, but I think her voice is very, very important and instrumental in the conservation of the Silent Valley, along with other scientists hmm. like B.C. Paul and uh, M.S. Swaminathan. So yes, in terms of conservation, very aware of it, um, very sad about what was happening in terms of development, and then quite actively conserving the Silent Valley. Uh, when it came. And with that, by then she was quite old. She was in her 70s and she was writing extensive letters to Darlington about mm -hmm. her role in, uh, in in the Silent Valley movement. Yes. I remember re reading some of those. Um, yes. 
the other question that amina has for you is what changes did janaki amal bring about in the botanical survey of india so what was in a sense the scope of change or what did she imagine needed to be changed at all so i think she reorganized it regionally uh, there were several and i have um, uh, the the, uh, the uh, you know i'm trying to see so basically when she reorganizes it um i have um a section here where i've talked about a uh, reorganization of the survey and i'll give you the different um areas which she reorganized it in to um sorry i'm giving you the states so she's um uh reorganizing it into the different uh, territorial uh, so the, i still haven't found it It's, um, it's quite interesting that you should uh, enter you. and reorganize and exist. I mean, it's a it's a fairly um, it's it's. I mean, the Botanical Survey of India belongs. So yeah, to yeah. So I'm just giving you the dates. Um, so in um, uh, she becomes an officer on special duty at the Regional Research Laboratory, Jammu, from 1959 to 62. Uh, so she reorganizes uh, she becomes the chairman of the cytogenetics department the regional research laboratory uh, again in jammu until 1964 um she organizes the uh, before this she's reorganized the um uh, the she set up the botanical uh, lab, uh, survey of india till 1954 so from 52 to 54 she's an officer on special duty for reorganizing the botanical survey of india Hmm. Uh, she becomes the director of the central botanical laboratory of the botanical survey of india until 1959 and this when she is reorganizing when she is becoming the director of the central botanical laboratory in 1959 that she sets up these different botanical circles in hmm. various parts of india so she is reorganizing the entire flora of india along regional lines hmm. so you have it in, in south india in in uh, uh, in uh, jammu for example so all these areas are set up to understand the plant the history of these regions so in some senses that is the work now because the, the number of circles in the, in the botanical laboratory under the botanical survey of india today is all marshaled round creating this new flora of india which hasn't been produced as i said since um hooker did it in 18, in the 1870s so how work still generating the new flora for india on a regional basis through the regional reorganizing of the botanical survey of india into these different circles all over india hmm. I, i suppose yeah. that makes sense yes yes and, and uh, so i think organizing it on i mean you know the botanical survey of india is among the earliest surveys right like it's, yes. it's it belong to the middle decades of the 19th century it's 1857 yes, yes. with the arrival of the rule of queen victoria and i mean you know the imperial institutions right like yes. to map the, to map what in those days was called the wealth of india Right, which yeah. included, of course, flora, fauna, and minerals. And so and these are regional uh, laboratories that she that she is setting up, and different circles that she is setting up at that time. Yeah, yeah. Which is so. So I think it's 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 sort of fascinating to see that she takes sort of a nearly hundred year old institution to reorganize it, um, and and in along a long regional lines. Yes. Yeah, along regional lines, and therefore also away from the concerns of imperial India. to newer concerns in that transition to in, independence in the transition yeah, yeah yeah so i think that's that's the interesting bit for those of you who have the opportunity in jammu there's a herbarium that um, janaki yeah. amal uh, collected and it's still available to see so if you have the opportunity do uh, do take a look um uh ah there we go i, I was wondering where she was uh, sita reddy has joined us and oh well she's probably been here all all while but she has a, a lovely question which is uh could you tell us a little about the new rose hybrid that's been named for janaki ammal oh yeah that's a very sweet question so the uh, uh the two uh, rose breeders um uh girija and venugopal and and in uh, vv giri and uh, uh in in south india uh, have mm. set up this new, new rose hybrid in honor of janaki ammal and this is a perfectly hybrid pink rose that uh, you can order i've had it sent to me and it's a great honor i'm sure that it's been planted now in the john innes institute as well um and it's been sent to various people just it's just a hybrid in honor of her um she herself 
is well known for the magnolia tree that if you go to the John Innes that you'll find yes. that she uh, is known as a magnolia, Janaki magnolia cobus. And hmm. you, can, you can find it if, on a visit to, uh, the, to Wisley, the Royal Horticultural Institute in Wisley. Okay. Uh, does it, this is hearsay, I have no idea. Does it have anything to do with the, with, with the sort of lavender pink saris that she had or that was among her favorite colors or something? You know, like? she also wore saffron. I don't know whether that's the case. I think okay. that she, um, it was just something that uh, Girija and Virugiri, they just developed out hmm. of their interest in rose hybrids. Okay. Interesting and, and quite lovely. Um, <laughs> yes. So I, I have a question. I, I'm not entirely sure how you'll think about it, but but let's try it anyway. Um, Sabita from London, you probably know her, um, has a question. How do you think young girls could be inspired to take up the study of botany, which is not as glamorous as AI or technology or something else? What could we do differently? What could, you know, in a, say, in a way, the education system do differently? What can be done to, in a way, you know, I mean, I think, I mean, while this is, you know, young girls, etc. I mean, you know, Sabita's concerns are, are well taken on board. But I think the larger question still is a, is a very, you know, it's, it's an interesting and fascinating question about what is the place of pure science in a, in a really sort of rapid changing, um, fascinated with speed, um, you know, kind of new horizon where the word innovation, which I which I find extremely difficult to deal with, in a way eclipses all um, interaction with nature or understanding of nature or, you know, sort of in a way distances um, learning and, and education from nature. So, you know, how does one bring about that love for science back? No way, again, Fascinating question. Thank you for that. I, you know, botany used to be a preserve of women in the early part of, in the late 19th century and the early part of the century, uh, 20th century in Britain. So mm. botany, in fact, was uh, downgraded as a science in Britain because of its association with women. Yes. It's only later on that it's links with genetics, cytology, genetics. Um, it, it enters, you know, it gets much more uh, credence as a as, as a science, but of course now in the context of uh, um, climate change and, uh, and the Anthropocene and so on, I think botany is is extremely plans and and the future of our uh, and planetary health is, is seems to be quite linked and um, uh, it, I don't think we need any encouragement to if you are interested in plans um, to be able to uh, you know, get onto that. Um, uh, bandwagon and, and become a plant scientist. Um, and I think plants are becoming much more fashionable. Uh, and as an environmental historian, looking at the history of uh, plant knowledge and plant transfers and, um, and not so much in plant science, that's not what I'm interested in, but um, plants have always been very much part of uh, the resource gathering of empires and plant knowledge has been very much part of um, from 1500 from the East India companies onwards um, till about 1900, botany and empire and rivalry were, were linked in resource extractions around the world. And I think plants still have a very important role to play in medicine and now in the changing way in which we, uh, in, in terms of the environment, um, they help us understand climate change. Um, and they are the future if we want to, if, if we want to save our planet, you know. Um, yeah. all sorts of plants and Janaki was interested in all sorts of crop, you know, crop plants um, uh, she was interested I suppose in intergenerate hybrids, she was interested in uh, medicinal plants uh, so it, plants you know, you know, we need to embrace plants for the future of the planet Absolutely. Um, yes uh, well, you know, that's my answer if that helps yes, and um, thank you that that's like, that sounds like a good note to call this evening to a close. Thank you so much, Vinita, for taking the time to be with us this evening. It's It's been a wonderful journey with you through the world of plants, but also absolutely crucially, the world of Janaki Ammal, a fascinating figure who I would love for all of us to engage with more seriously than we have until now.